I just came back from a trip to Savannah, Georgia here in the United States, and I had the time of my life. I enjoyed myself so much. I had never thought that I was going to love Savannah as much as I did. I went to Savannah, Georgia as a child with my family, and I enjoyed it a lot. We were there for maybe two or three days. And this time I went by myself. It was my first plane flight uh, in the midst of the pandemic in two years or over just over two years. Um, I had been doing road trips during the pandemic, but this time I went on a plane, four planes actually, two to go there, two to come back. And it felt great actually to travel and I felt safe with my mask. And once I was there uh, being vaccinated and boosted, I felt safe going around and enjoying the city. And I just, I just absolutely fell in love, in love with Savannah. I cannot wait to go back. I am here back in New York City. I'm already planning my next trip in my head. And I'm seeing little signs in my surroundings on social media that are telling me to go ahead and book another trip to Savannah soon. So TBD. So most people might know Savannah, Georgia, because of a popular book and movie called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which is a book that I actually bought for myself while I was in Savannah. I bought a paperback copy and I plan to read it soon. Savannah, Georgia is a major part of U.S. history. So in 1773, it was established as a British colonial capital in the province of Georgia. And it was a major port city during the American Revolutionary War and the American Civil War. Now, when I was a teenager, I remember being on a ghost tour and learning that Savannah is pretty much a city of corpses because there has been so much war in Savannah in its history. You're bound to be in a part of the city where there are unidentified remains of somebody. I did a paranormal investigation on my second night, I believe, my first night in Savannah at the Savannah Theater. The Savannah Theater opened its doors in 1818, and over the past two centuries, it has seen multiple repairs and renovations due to multiple fires, one of them which happened in 1948. Now, among notable folks who either visited the theater to see a show or perform there were Oscar Wilde, which is incredible, W.C. Fields, Tyrone Power, and Edwin Booth, an actor and the brother of another actor named... John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Abraham Lincoln. So I booked a tour with Truth in Evidence Haunted Tours. You can find them at T-I-E, as in like tie, like a necktie, T-I-E hauntedtours.com. They were really great. Now, I'm going to set the scene for you. We're in this theater. We're getting the historical context of the theater before we do our investigation. And the tour lead tells us, As we go room to room talking about the history, we're going to shut the lights off behind us in the room. And we're going to be in a dark theater. Every part of the theater was dark, except the lobby. So we're in this theater, a dark theater. And being in a dark historic theater, that's creepy enough. But knowing that it's a haunted dark theater, very creepy and spooky. I felt a little nervous, not going to lie. But what's interesting is ever since I started practicing mediumship... I feel a little more brave going into these situations. So I'm sitting in this dark theater and I'm reminding myself, Juan, you talk to dead people a lot. You channel the souls of departed loved ones a lot. What's the difference here? These are just souls that are not connected to anyone personally here in this theater with me. So I felt pretty comfortable. There was one part of the theater where I did feel a little nervous, and that was the dressing room, and it's where they say the weirdest activity happens, I believe, or some odd activity happens. I felt very weird there, but otherwise, I felt very comfortable. Oh, and also the projection room. So the projection room is today just a storage room, so they do not project movies as they used to. It's been boarded up and is now just a place to store costumes and seasonal items like Christmas, holiday decorations. And a man who ran the projector during its days as a film theater had a heart attack in that projection room. So people do tend to feel uncomfortable there. And I I did. Now, when we started the tour, 
my breathing was being labored and my heart was beating really fast in my chest. And I was excited to be there, but this felt very not, um, it just felt very out of the blue. I just felt this, these sensations, labored breathing and my heart beating really fast. And it was maybe 30 minutes later, we were talking about the projector, the, the, the projection room with the tour lead. He was telling the history and the story of the projection room. And he mentioned that he himself does not like to go into that room because it just makes him feel very uncomfortable. And he starts feeling like he's about to have a panic attack. So I told him in front of the group, hey, so before my heart was beating really fast and I, my breathing was labored and yeah, I felt like I was going to have a panic attack, but I was feeling that when we were all talking, you know, in the lobby stairway area, maybe that was George, the projection person who worked in that space before it was boarded up. Maybe it was him. Maybe I was feeling him. I don't know. I can't tell. I couldn't tell you for sure. The first place where we started was in the, the main theater with all the seats and the stage. And we're sitting there and we have a spirit box. So for those of you who don't know what a spirit box is, I'm going to give you the best definition that I can give because I, am, I don't know the technicality of how a spirit box works, but I can try and explain it. So a spirit box is this device that has an antenna. It looks like it could be a radio, but what it does is it sweeps through all radio transmission that it can access. It sweeps through maybe like a half a second each radio station or radio transmission that's available. It sweeps through and through and through. So you're going to hear like for half a second, a piece of music, half a second, like some Dua Lipa, half a second, some classical music It's going through all the radio stations. But the goal is if you can hear something saying something or making some kind of a noise, any kind of noise, could be very well be music, could be someone speaking, someone playing an instrument. If you hear that sound over the course of different transmission sweeps, that's very likely to be paranormal evidence because that means that something paranormal or supernatural is controlling that device and speaking over several transmissions, whereas what would be normal, quote unquote, is you just hear half a second or a second of little bits of sounds from each radio station that, it's, that the device is sweeping through. I hope that makes sense. So we're all in this theater, this dark theater, and we have the spirit box on and we are asking questions. And there was one question that someone asked, I think, said, can you come out and say hello? And this male's voice just went, hello? Like very, very clearly. And we all kind of froze. And we kept talking with whatever was coming through the device, asking questions like there was one young person who asked, hey, can I audition for you? And I forgot what the response was, but different questions like that. Because the person that we feel was coming through the box, the spirit box, was the the soul of the, a former manager, director who worked at the theater, who was known to be a very strict, firm person, not a very kind person. And we, I think that was who was who said hello. I mean, he was being very kind. You know, on the other side, I do believe that they give us parts of their personality that they had on earth, but also they just know better. They know to be kind as long as we're kind to them. <laughs> so anything with the ego that he might have had in the physical world, he left it here. And he over there, he's much happier, but he will show some of his personality. And then we were let to uh, we were permitted to go and investigate on our own. Uh, well, first of all, I joined a little group. Uh, we all went as little groups into different rooms of the theater, and I went into the dressing room, and I was like, great, <laughs> this is the first place I'm going to go into. It is the creepiest spot. Great. So we went in there, me and this little group, and then after investigating our assigned rooms, then we were permitted, all of us individually, to go wherever we wanted to go in the theater to investigate. So starting in the dressing room, it was very creepy. We didn't really get much evidence. It was pretty quiet, but I was feeling sensations. I could feel the energy of the room changing. And knowing that it's a dressing room of all of these different items, like for me, when I'm in a space where there are a lot of items, like an antique store, a gas station, a, like a department store with a lot, a lot of things, I tend to feel uncomfortable and a little claustrophobic. So it being a dark dressing room of only our phone lights, <laughs> it was very uncomfortable for me. And there were some points where I just felt like there was somebody in the room with us, like watching us, but there wasn't. So all I can say is that we didn't get much hardcore evidence. It was more just the sensations we were feeling. And I definitely felt a presence in that dressing room. And then we went 
our separate ways, all of us, and I decided to go up to the projection room. Dead quiet space, very uncomfortable, <laughs> really uncomfortable. I didn't quite like it, but it was interesting to be in there. And then I went on my own to the back of the theater where, uh, it, how, how would you call it? There's stage, uh, there's stage right, there's stage left, there's upstage, there's downstage. This, this would be up, behind upstage, like where, where the actors are behind the backdrop of a play walking around. And there's some, maybe some dressing room equipment or some like vanity mirrors. So I was in that area and there's this little boy who they say haunts the theater. His name is Ben. And Ben is a very playful soul. And we did hear the the sound of a young boy come through a spirit box at the back of the theater when we were interacting with the spirit box and asking questions, saying hi. And that was pretty marvelous. It felt so cool to hear this young boy come through. And I forgot exactly what he said, but I remember it was like a lot of cooing noises, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, just like little kid noises, um, just making sounds and uh, I think there was one instance where I asked, hey, Ben, uh, tell me your favorite animal. I love animals. And I'm pretty sure the voice said, sheep. I kind of have it on video, but I think I remember the voice saying something like that. And again, a sp- this is a spirit box going through many radio transmissions. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but sweeping through many radio transmissions and stations. And here is this voice that is crossing over, no pun intended, cro- the voice is crossing over several transmissions saying, sheep. And then when the night ended, it was 1 a.m., which is a very late hour to be at a haunted dark theater. And I have to say, you know, in the past, I would have thought, you know, I, I wish I had my sage or my crystals and I, that I could like, I was wearing, I was wearing an amethyst around my neck. But other than that, I wish I would have had my Palo Santo or my sage. But I left that theater feeling not threatened by anything. And that's what the tour lead told us at the beginning. There's nothing bad here. You just have to respect the souls of the departed and you'll be fine. So I felt very protected. I felt very good going back to my hotel. And I it really it really opened my my mind to the idea of there's no need to feel scared when you're going into a paranormal investigation. Of course it depends on the history. I do believe that where uh, where there has been maybe a murder or someone was a truly unhappy person when they were in the physical world, you have to go in with some very strong intention to keep yourself safe and those who are with you safe. And if you, I mean, if you want to cleanse yourself before and after you enter to an investigation in a very difficult space, do it. Because I've done that before. My first paranormal investigation, I went home and I staged my apartment. I felt much better. I also had a very different mindset back then. That Back then, I was afraid of investigations. Based on my own experience, if you ever do an investigation, go in protecting yourself in the universe's white light. And then when you leave, really, really sit with how you're feeling or really understand how you're feeling as you are ending and then leaving a paranormal investigation. And if you feel any way uncomfortable, say a prayer, get some sage. Um, you know, sage is not the only thing that can cleanse you. Sage is just a tool. So you can cleanse yourself without using sage. But if sage is that thing that will empower you and encourage you as you cleanse yourself, use it. But otherwise, you can just use prayer and your own energy and the energy of the universe to cleanse yourself and imagine yourself engulfed in this white protective light. That's my true belief. That's my opinion also. So there are different approaches to cleansing yourself after investigation that are out there. So listen to and grab onto whatever resonates the most with you. So in other parts of my trip, I also visited the Sorrel Weed House, which is a very well-known haunted spot in the United States. And Savannah has been featured on TV shows like Ghost Adventures on Travel Channel. And I had done an investigation or rather a ghost tour, a child-friendly ghost tour, at the Sorrel Weed House with my family in the past, but this time it was a paranormal investigation that started at 11.30 p.m. and ended at 2 a.m. My kind of vibe. And it wasn't at all creepy. It was not creepy. I want to reiterate that. It was spooky. Spooky is quite different, but it wasn't scary. And I was paired up with a group of folks who were actually from Miami, funny enough, and I'm originally from Miami, so that was meant to be. And one of them was expressing how scared they were. And I told them, you know, ghosts are just like us. We are also ghosts. We're just in human bodies. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Spooky 
yes. Scary, not so much. And I felt very empowered and very okay being at the Sorrel Weed House, which is known for being one of the spookiest, scariest places in the in the world, actually. It's really well known in Savannah and across the world uh, amongst paranormal investigative circles. Like I said, Ghost Adventures has been there. And the story of the Sorrel Weed House... And I only know this one personal story about the folks at the Sorrel Weed House. I don't know the exact historical context of the house. So the history of the Sorrel Weed House includes the family uh, of Francis Sorrel, if I'm saying that name right. Sorrel, Sorrel. And he was married to Matilda, and they had an enslaved young woman named Molly. And the story goes that According to the paranormal investigator that was leading the tour I was on, Molly was tasked with helping to set up an event at the home, and Matilda was leading the event. Matilda was looking for Molly to ask how the planning was going, and she couldn't find Molly. So she looked around the home, couldn't find her. She went to the carriage house where Molly's quarters were and found her husband, Francis, with Molly. And... I really appreciate how the paranormal investigator framed this story by saying to consider that Molly was an enslaved person and her enslaver was in this situation with her in her room. And it's very likely that this enslaver took advantage of his enslaved person, Molly. So Matilda, in distress, left the scene, went back into the Sorrel home, went to the third floor, and the next thing folks knew she was, she had fallen or jumped, whoever believes what story, onto the first floor below and passed away. Molly, from what I remember learning, took her own life not long after Matilda's death. So it is said that the, the souls of Molly Matilda haunt the home, as well as the soul of Francis Sorrell, who was a, a doctor and a surgeon, had his surgical office in the basement of the home, which we were allowed to investigate. But there are also the souls of children and uh, some ens- enslaved children, as well as children of the Sorrell, uh, Sorrell Weed family. And it it was a very interesting night, and I my heart really went out to the souls of of the people who were enslaved by this family. And one thing I want to quickly mention is historic properties across this country, the United States, are beginning to be even more clear about the fact that there were enslaved people who helped build these homes. It doesn't matter whether they are in the northern part of the United States or the south. And for those who are not familiar with U.S. history, the American Civil War was between the north and the south. And one big part of uh, the the reason that war occurred, that civil war occurred, was because the north wanted to abolish slavery and the south wanted to keep it, amongst other issues such as succession. The south wanted to be its own country. There was just a lot of other factors. But slavery and enslavement was one of the biggest, biggest reasons for the American Civil War. So I I really appreciate the fact that historic properties across the U.S. are being more transparent about the fact that enslaved people helped build these historic homes, which are now museums, or worked at these homes and made them what they are today so that we can see them today. So being in this Sorrel Weed House and feeling like I was communicating with the souls of enslaved people, which I definitely feel like we did, was really humbling. And I felt like I I just had so much respect. And there was a point where we were using our flashlights to communicate with the other side. The paranormal investigator recommended using flashlights and having them on and telling the souls to to manipulate the lights of the flashlights, to dim them, to show that their presence is in the room with us. So we did that, and that exactly happened. Someone's flashlight was changing uh, l- luminescent strength. I don't know—is that the right phrase to use? Was just it was it was blinking, it was dimming, and it was brightening, it was lowering. And then in another room, we were using a spirit box, and we asked if Molly was present. We were actually in Molly's room, and the voice of a woman did come through, and particularly liked being around the EMF detector of one of the women in my small group that I was assigned to be with. 
So those are my two paranormal experiences in Savannah. Nothing too flashy. You know, when you go on these investigations, don't expect a jump scare. Don't expect to have the experience of a travel channel or discovery channel show. It's not like that. Those shows are edited, first of all. I'm not saying they're fake, but they're edited. And getting evidence that is so mind-blowing can take so much time. It's a lot of waiting and waiting and waiting and asking questions again and again and again. And we were there for only two and a half hours. Some investigators, they're at a haunted spot for like between sunset and sunrise. Some other things I did in Savannah, I I got ice cream at Leopold's, which was absolutely delicious. Oh my gosh. I got a, it was like a cookies and cream, chewy cookies, chewy cookies and cream. It was like the cookies, the cream, and then some pecans, like chewy pecans. Oh my gosh. So good. Highly recommend Leopold's. But I also went to Bonaventure Cemetery, which is a very well-known cemetery in Savannah, And I also went to the Owens Thomas house and uh, slave quarters, which was, uh, it was a very interesting home. And seeing the quarters of the enslaved people was, again, I'm going to use the word again, very, very humbling. And just, just, it is such a reminder of the fact that our country in the United States is the way it is today. And many people's homes are the way they are today because of the labor of enslaved people. And then, um, There were some other parts of Savannah I explored that were not really... Actually, well, it's hard to say that some part of Savannah is not tied to history. But I went to the riverfront, which is super tied to history, but has a lot of modern shops there. It's really great. It's a great spot. Really cute. And I also went to some fabulous restaurants. There's the... I think it's called the Old Pink House, which is set in an old mansion, had delicious Southern food. I went to 1790, which is a very well-known haunted spot in Savannah. It's an inn and a restaurant, and I ate in the restaurant. and had delicious, probably the best fried chicken I've ever had with mashed potatoes and assorted vegetables, as the menu said. All in all, I had a, an incredible time in Savannah, and I cannot wait to go back. And I, I almost felt like I could I could live there one day. It was just so wonderful. And maybe other folks won't have the same reaction to being in Savannah or visiting. But if you're a big history buff and you love haunted history or just places that are haunted, Savannah is the place you have to add to your bucket list because it is quite a city and it's very walkable. There are old buildings everywhere. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous city in the southern United States where the weather is much warmer than it is in the northern United States where I live. Add it to your list. I'm so happy I got to share with you my experiences in Savannah, and I hope it inspires you to add it to your list, like I said, of places to go to in the next year or two. And if you have any questions about Savannah, where to go, where to eat, where to stay, send me a DM on Instagram. You can find me at Juan Francisco NY on Instagram. And you can also find my website, thirdeyesight.media. Use the contact form, reach out to me. And just a reminder that I am booking readings right now. And if you want to book a reading with me, all the information is on thirdeyesight.media. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your day. If you have a question or topic you want me to cover on Third Eye Sight, head to my website, juanfranciscospirit.com slash contact and send a message my way. If you really enjoyed this episode, leave a review wherever you listen. I'd really appreciate it.